Good afternoon. I am Joanne Ross, President and Chief Advertising Revenue Officer at Viacom CBS. It is my great honor to welcome you to the Viacom CBS Veterans Network Women in Service panel as part of the Women's History Month celebrations. Viacom CBS Veterans Network offers the veteran and military family community a forum for connecting, networking, and for personal and professional development. It also provides much needed community support. The theme of today's panel is women in service. And when I think of service, the first group that comes to mind for me are the women who serve our country. Thank you for your service. We are grateful. During the pandemic, the role of women who are frontline and essential workers has never been more important. We thank you for your service and all of your sacrifices. As the first woman to serve as an ad sales chief of a broadcast network, I know all too well what it takes to break that glass ceiling. We women are the nation's superheroes. And I want to thank the panelists here today who continue to inspire and empower our veteran and military families. And now it also gives me great pleasure to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Jim Axelrod. Jim is the Chief Investigative and Senior National Correspondent for CBS News, reporting for CBS This Morning, the CBS Evening News, CBS Sunday Morning, and other CBS News broadcasts. While at CBS News, Jim has covered a broad range of domestic and international stories, notably, the war in Iraq and the American invasion of Afghanistan. In 2003, Jim was the first television journalist to report live from Baghdad Saddam International Airport immediately after it was taken and secured by US troops after that historic battle. His live coverage of the US Army firing artillery rounds into Iraqi positions was the first to be broadcast by a reporter embedded with ground troops engaged in combat in Iraq. Jim also covered the departure of US troops from Iraq and was the last reporter to leave with the military in December, 2011. Jim has always been a friend to the Viacom CBS Veterans Network and we are thrilled that he is embedded with us here today. Please join me in welcoming our dear friend and esteemed colleague, Jim Axelrod. Joanne, thank you so much, uh, not just for your kind introduction, but for your service and your leadership at Viacom CBS. In this industry, we can't underscore this enough. Your career has had history making impact. It is such an honor for me to be the moderator of this panel today. As Joanne just said, and I can't agree any more strongly, women are the nation's superheroes. I can't think of a better way of spending the next hour or so than hearing from some of these superheroes. So let's meet the four women uh, we're gonna be spending some time with and hearing their thoughts about service and community and resilience. Meryl Tengestal is a retired Air Force Colonel who served the United States of America for more than 23 years as a pilot and senior leader. You wanna talk impressive? She is the first and at this point, the only African-American woman to fly the U-2 aircraft and has among other achievements, logged more than 300 combat hours in Iraq and Afghanistan. We know she's tough as nails because she's a cast member of the CBS competition series, Tough as Nails, and has plenty of insight to offer us this evening. So Meryl, welcome and thank you for being with us. Dawn Halfacre is the founder and CEO of Halfacre and Associates, an IT company that's been extraordinarily successful working with government organizations. You want someone with something to say about service? Well, Halfacre and Associates lays it out all quite clearly with its corporate vision, continuing to serve. She also knows about sacrifice. A West Point graduate, Dawn served as a military police officer in the United States Army Gravely wounded during a combat patrol near Baghdad in 2004, Dawn earned a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star for
for her service. She is an active and supporter, uh, active member and supporter of numerous civic, cultural, and business organizations, and is a staunch advocate for both veterans and for wounded warriors. Dawn, we are grateful for the time you're spending with us tonight, and as always, very grateful for your service to this country. We're lucky to have Emily Brandstetter as well with us tonight. She's a staff writer for the CBS show, The United States of Al, which is, I believe, premiering this week and explores the friendship between a Marine combat vet trying to readjust to civilian life and an Afghan interpreter who served with the unit and is also trying to adjust to his new life in America. Emily also has a, a personal window into vets and veteran related issues. Her partner, Matt, spent 12 years on active duty with the Marines and continues to serve in the reserves. Emily, thank you as well for your presence on the panel. And rounding out our group, the one and only Chanel Lamb is with us as well, an HR director here at Viacom CBS, where she is active with the Viacom CBS Veterans Network. Chanel has 15 years of experience in the media and entertainment industry a proud veteran of the U.S. Army, serving both stateside and overseas with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment and the 501st Military Intelligence Battalion. So thank you, everybody, for being part of the, uh, the panel. I guess I'd, I'd like to start off tonight with a sort of a broad question, just to sort of set up an index point, if you will, about sort of where we are as we are telling and celebrating women's achievements and and barrier busting. I believe that should be 12 months a year, but this is the, we're nearing the end of the one month on the calendar where we really spend a little bit of extra attention on the idea. So generally speaking, and Meryl, why don't we start with you? Where do each of you feel our culture is in terms of a quality of opportunity, professional, personal, where are we? Meryl? So thank you, Jim. You can hear me, correct? I can. How you doing? All right. It's good um, to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you so much. I think the opportunities from where I started before entering the service in the Navy back in 94 uh, to now, I think the opportunities have grown um, and it's a great continuation. I think we have further to go. I, I remember in, 19, in 94 when I was looking at the military as an option to join, I remember the Marine Corps still was not accepting females in a combat pilot role. Mm. Um, I remember, you know, in the Navy, there was a push for minorities and women to become pilots. So um, we fast forward Why was forward that now. something you wanted to do, Meryl? What, why did you want to be a, a combat pilot? Um, I wanted to always be an astronaut since I was seven years old. So uh, <laughs> I always had that desire. And I knew at seven, I built a, uh, a basic framework and I knew going to school and joining the military as a pilot was something that I was interested in. And combat pilot, of course, who doesn't want weapons on their aircraft? So um, that was something that interests me very much. And uh, I just remember those people saying those things back then. But now, as you look forward uh, to 2021, you have women who are in combat roles in, in and doing major significant things. Um, I left the military retired with over 330 combat hours. So things have, have improved. We still got a long way to go. So I'm excited though. Don, what do you make of where we're at right now? Don F. Aker. Sure, yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, you know, and, and I think I really agree with, you know, kind of what Meryl said, you know, I, uh, I joined a little bit later, um, right after 2001, after the, the Twin Towers came down. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, kind of the opportunities uh, that I had going, going into the military, sort of selecting a, a branch and all of that. And then thinking about, you know, kind of where we are today, where I'm watching women graduate ranger school, um, <laughs> women now in special forces. So, uh, you know, I, I think that where we are today is a long way from where we were and where we started. Um, but I still think that, you know, as I sort of transitioned out of the military and into the business world, it, you know, I see a different angle. And I see the fact that, you know, I think, Again, um, you know, on the civilian side, I think we, we've also come a long way. You know, there's a lot of statistics out there about, you know, sort of women in, in corporations, women in leadership roles, 
um, you know, women running Fortune 500 companies. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're probably not where we need to be. I think there's more work to be done, um, but I think it's something that we really need to put an emphasis on. And I, I think some of the things that I've learned, you know, sort of running and leading a company is, you know, women have to see women in other leadership roles. Um, and I think at the same time, you know, we as leaders need to ensure that we are providing an environment where women can be successful. Um, women have a lot of responsibilities. They tend to be, you know, if even if they're working, they do tend to sort of, you know, have to, to focus on the children and the family and, and have you know, some additional responsibility that, that it, in, in some cases their male counterparts may not have. And so I think that's something that, you know, I've become very sensitive to women going on maternity leave, um, you know, really having a lot of policies and things like that, that really enable women to be able to sort of, you know, as, as we call it, lean in and, and, and do, you know, have a career and also be able to kind of, you know, attend to their family responsibility. So, you know, overall, uh, I think a lot of progress has been made, but there's just, you know, a lot more that we can do to kind of, you you know, ho hopefully continue to, to ensure that, you know, there is no glass ceiling and really break through. We, we will circle back to some of the points you just raised, but I just want to follow with one quick question, Don. Uh, I ask my wife and my daughter about this all the time. When you take a look at where women are, is it a question of looking where you came from, as you say, where you started? Do you look at, hey, that's progress? Or do you focus more on where you aren't yet in terms of destination, the, the eventual destination? How do you balance that? Yes, we've made progress, but no, we're not anywhere near where we need to be in terms of equality of opportunity. Yeah, I mean, Jim, that's such a great question um, and, and really a great point. I think that, you know, it, it's all relative, right? So, you know, you maybe talk to women, you know, 50 years, my my elder, and, and maybe they, you know, they're, they're looking at where we are today, you know, maybe with a different perspective. But I, I think to your point, though, if we don't sort of set a threshold or a benchmark of where we want to be, we're never going to get there, right? It's sort of like, okay, well, you know, are we, are we content with just kind of inching along? Or do we want to say that, you know, you know, sort of equality is the quality and, and here's what we're really striving for. So I, I think that's a really great point. And I think if we are to sort of, you know, do that and really think about where, where, where we ought to be, um, you know, perhaps there's, you know, maybe a stronger push and, um, you know, more, more of a movement that we need to muster to kind of, you know, to kind of get us there. Yeah, it's always a question of, of establishing some kind of balance. I, I totally get that. Emily, let me ask, let me bring you in, Emily Brandstetter, and ask you a question because you work, um, and, and this is sort of not just the military, but in terms of our culture in general, you work in the entertainment industry. And given the last couple of years of the Me Too movement, Emily, what have you seen in terms of a quality of opportunity and conscious attempts to change? Um, well, thank you, Jim, uh, for having me here today. Um, I would say, in, in entertainment, things are definitely changing. Um, for the show that I write on, we have the co-creator of our show is um, a woman, and there are several women in the writer's room, which has not always been the case in comedy. Um, and these women are, are, are um, you know, voicing people, voicing characters that we want to be real, and so real experiences. Um, and so I think that we're moving in the right direction for sure. Does it feel different to you in 2021 than it did in 2019, 2018, in terms of what you experience every day? Absolutely. Um, opinions are welcomed and valued even from younger people in the room. Um, just, you know, really a great opportunity to to share and an environment where you feel safe to do that. Mm -hmm. Chanel, um, if I could ask you, Chanel, you were active duty late 90s, early 2000s. So it's been 20 years or so since you've been in sort of the private sector, but you were very active, Chanel, in terms of um, veterans network uh, uh, and, and veterans, uh, you talk to a lot of vets. What do you uh, feel has um, been the sort of state of affairs in terms of equality of opportunity in the workplace? 
Thanks so much, Jim. Um, I remember it when I joined the military in 1996, and there were not a lot of women in leadership positions. And I remember um, leading a team of about six males at the time. And I know today there are so many women in leadership positions. We have Joanne Ross and we have other women who um, really are standing toe to toe with um, males in their, in, in their field. So I think that we have come a long way as far as equality, um, both in the military and in corporate sector. Um, I do think that we have a long way to go, but I see a great, great improvement. Is it still a thing, Chanel, when you are dealing with having men reporting to you? Are you in, in 2021 aware of sort of the gender of who's reporting to you? And does it enter into the dynamic of, of the relationship? I must say not as much now. Um, That's progress. That's great. <laughs> It is. It's great progress. Um, in 1996, and when I was in the military, um, it, well, in 1996, I wasn't a sergeant, so I didn't lead a team. But more in the 2000s, when I did lead, lead a team, it was absolutely a thing, right? You had to be very conscious and you had to, you know, make sure you earned the respect of not only your male counterparts, but your the, the soldiers that were under you. Um, now, I think that men understand um, that women, the place that women held um, hold in corporate America, I think that men also respect it. So it's not as challenging now as it used to be. Merrill, I want to ask you, let's send it back to Merrill for a second. 23 years of, of service. Um, does the military, from your view, where you sit now, pay enough attention to addressing, it's been a sort of a headline issue, but does the military pay enough attention to addressing issues of sexual harassment and sexual assault in the military right now? So I'll, I will answer this question from an Air Force perspective since I retired from the Air Force um, in 2017. And I, you know, I worked in the Inspector General's office. I was the Director of Inspections. So uh, in terms of sexual harassment and for women, uh, I think that is that was being more addressed. Um, it's something that the military does not accept. And it's, you know, it's inappropriate at its highest forms. And to allow women to come forward, that's something that they worked at, at the Pentagon level, at least in the Air Force, as also, and they trickled that down to um, commanders. And a lot of emphasis was placed on that in terms of women and other people who are being harassed to be able to step forward and have the space in this environment where they're allowed to talk freely and not be judged. So I think it's something that the military has, has to constantly work on. It has gotten better, but sometimes there are some people that fall through, but the military from an Air Force perspective takes it very seriously. And I can't think that the other sister services wouldn't do that as well. All right, so one of the things that we really want to headline in our conversation tonight is the concept of resilience, all right? So Dawn, if you don't mind, I think I'd like to go to you first because the story of your injury and the life that you built following your injury is a remarkable story of resilience. Would you mind sharing with us um, sort of the place where you found yourself? Um, I, I imagine even with all your experience, you didn't know how much you actually had to have in your tank to sort of rebuild. Can you share where you found yourself, where you are now, and what the role of resilience was in the process of, of getting there? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to share. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, you know, my situation, um, you know, it was interesting. I, I was I was sort of uh, grew up, um, I was an athlete uh, in school. And, you know, it, the, the interesting part about being an athlete is, you know, you're learning to, to win and lose and learning to sort of, you know, when you get injured, you know, kind of push through things. And um, going into the military, you know, you don't, at least I didn't kind of go into combat, you know, I was young, necessarily thinking that, you know, I was going to get injured and um, learning the realities of war and being sort of confronted with that, um, you know, getting very seriously injured. I, I lost my right arm uh, to a, you know, I was on the wrong end of a rocket propelled grenade, um, you know, over, over in Iraq. And 
um, you know, was wounded very, very seriously and, and found myself sort of, you know, waking up from a coma after about two weeks um, while I was at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, woke up to this reality that, you know, I no longer had my right arm. Um, and so I had to kind of grapple with that. Um, my military career was over, um, you know, sort of unexpectedly. And I was, you know, 24 years old, wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I think that, you know, we all go through, you know, difficult things and challenges. And, you know, you sort of have those moments where, you know, it's, it's like, wow, I can go one of two ways here. Um, I can either, you know, figure out a way to overcome this uh, and, and, and fight my way back or, you know, you sort of succumb to it. And I think that, you know, um, my, my, you know, turning point was really looking around and looking to sort of my fellow wounded warriors who I think were, were pushing through, um, were very inspiring, um, you know, women in, in, in several cases, I was injured, you know, Danielle Green, um, Notre Dame basketball player was at my bedside, Tammy Duckworth, you know, United States Senator was at my bedside, um, you know, and we all sort of banded together and just decided we were going to move on and, and you know, in, in every, you know, bit of adversity, you can find opportunity. And, and I think that's, that's what I did. And that's, that's what I continue to do is, you know, you kind of push through life. How long did it take you to find your footing? Well, you know, Jim, I, I feel like I'm always trying to find my footing uh, and, and maybe some of us can relate to that, you know, day in and day out, um, you know, just balancing work and life and motherhood and all these different things we have to grapple with, you know, and, and in my case, doing it, you know, with, with, with only one arm, sometimes it can be challenging, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I think that I just continue to be inspired by, you know, all the great things that, um, you know, our, our service members are out there doing. I try to keep perspective about, you know, okay, well, you know, is, is this really a challenge? Is my day really hard? You know, when, when we still have people sort of, you know, overseas volunteering, um, you know, and, and, and serving the country. So I think I just, you know, continue to try to find inspiration wherever I can. And, and remember that, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, life is always throwing things at us. We don't know, you know, what that's going to be, but, you know, it's important that we figure out how to continue to move forward. How do you define resilience? I mean, I really think resilience is, is the idea that, you know, you, as, as I say in business, you know, you get, you know, I get punched in the face every day and, and the next morning I have to get up uh, no matter what's going on, you know, no matter how early my kids come in my room and wake me up. <laughs> how much sleep I get or, you know, that, or, you know, whatever the day's uh, challenge ahead may be, you know, you got to get up and you got to confront it and you got to get through it. Um, and you got to make the most of it. And just remember that, you know, we have, um, you know, th there's, there's a lot of things that we have to, to be, um, you know, happy about and excited about and, um, blessed for, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, and, and did you, you know, you mentioned it as you were just explaining, I'm just curious, was there something particularly um, comforting or edifying in the sisterhood of, of female military, uh, either officers or fellow injured vets who were able to give you something specific um, just by virtue of sharing that part of the experience being female? Did you draw anything special or extra from the comfort of a Tammy Duckworth bedside? You know, I, I think there was, I think that, you know, as we talk about sisterhood, you know, and we talk about just the, the, the differences um, of, of, you know, really how you identify as a female veteran versus a male veteran, um, you know, some of the unique challenges of, you know, just some of the women, I, I didn't have children at the time, but um, some of the women did and, and the unique challenges, uh, you know, faced with that. And I think also just you know, the way society perceives women, you know, versus men, I think the idea that, you know, women sort of looking differently or, or having these sort of battle scars, you know, it, it isn't necessarily sort of like the point of pride that, you know, right. potentially a, a, a male may have, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, if people see me for the first time, maybe they don't know me, you know, they don't assume I was injured in combat, they assume, you know, I had cancer or something like that. And so right. I, I think having fellow women to sort of, you know, lean on and get through it, um, you know, we were, we were trailblazers together. You know, I think Danielle Green was one of the first female amputees from, um, you know, from the war and it, you know, and then you get Tammy Duckworth, you know, helicopter pilot, you know, almost lost her, her, her arm as well, missing both legs. I mean, you know, these women were all trailblazers and I think we were all just having to, to band together and, and, you know, chart this sort of, you know, uncharted territory. 
Chanel, as you're listening to Don speak, I'm curious, um, as a vet, do you, is there a, a sisterhood of female vets that give you something as you compare notes, not only your experience in the military, but life after the military, that is particular or specific that you don't get from speaking with male vets? Yeah, I think it's always, I think it's very interesting, the um, female perspective when you talk about the military and the challenges that we had versus the challenges that some of our male um, soldiers had. So the answer is yes, I do think that you get something very specific from that um, bonding with um, women in the military um, because they understand the challenges that um, you know that we've gone through while in the military. Um, other other challenges that males would go through um, that you know the males would not necessarily understand. So yes, I do think there's something specific you would get from women. It must be so powerful for you, and it must be so uh, comforting to be understood or to have someone understand exactly what you're talking about in terms of your experiences as you sort of process your life in the military and then we're transitioning into sort of civilian life to have that kind of support and, and network, if you will. It is, it's very comforting. And I really appreciate the Veterans Network even for that today because um, they continue to bring in um, female veterans and support female veterans, um, all veterans, but it's really nice to have that network mm -hmm. and to have that place where you belong and there are soldiers who kind of understand the challenges in the military. Emily, your entire professional life right now is focused on writing a story of resilience, really. I mean, this relationship on the United States of Al is about a lot of things, but wouldn't you say resilience is a key part of the relationship? Absolutely. Um, we have two characters that are going through major changes in their lives. We have um, Al, who is an Afghan interpreter who's moving to the United States. And then we have Riley, who is a combat veteran who is now transitioning into civilian life. And, and both of those things come with their unique challenges, but resilience is really a theme in the show in facing obstacles and using the support system of the family to kind of, you know, find, find their next path. So how do you ground yourself um, writing for characters? How do you ground yourself in the reality of the issues vets face, interpreters face, people that have been in combat face, uh, where do, what do you draw upon? We're fortunate to have a very diverse writer's room. We have Afghan and Afghan Americans in our writer's room, um, as well as some veterans. And then I am uh, sort of represent the, the spouse perspective or the, um, the partner. You know, when a military uh, person is deployed, the whole family is going through an experience. Um, and, and when that same, when that veteran decides to transition into a new, you know, phase of life, that involves the entire family. Um, so we really try to pull from our own experiences and put them on TV. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? I think the spouse relationship, partner relationship is very, very important for folks to understand. Anyone who is married or connected to a veteran in any way is probably watching this and shaking their head vigorously up and down because there are parts to your partner's life that must be understood for you to be able to have a, a successful enriching relationship, correct? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> on a comedic note, the first present I got from Matt for my birthday was um, a ruck backpack and, and <laughs> weights, you know, bricks, covered in duct tape, which, you know, is, is a surprising birthday present. Um, but, but, you know, there's, there's such a part of the military that is ingrained in the service member, their, their life is to serve. And so understanding that that is such an, um, an important part of the, who they are kind of defines your relationship. Yeah. I, I mean, I was uh, embedded with the third infantry division, which Don uh, served with as well. And I was just embedded, just watching um, these remarkable men and women uh, sort of conducting their business under these un un crazy conditions, in some cases, just given watching war continue in the middle of a sandstorm, for instance. And I realized one of my big takeaways was, wow, unless 
you have been closely connected, you really have no idea what is involved in the life of a returning service member trying to reintegrate and establish themselves back in society. It's an entirely unique set of emotional uh, constructs that they have to find a way to integrate, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's everything from having to figure out how to how to write a resume when you come home to, you know, parents making dinner for their kids and just the the gravity of of combat and then coming home to home life and and that juxtaposition. Um, there's a there's a lot of different elements that go into it. Meryl, tell us about your life transitioning after this long, successful career with the United States Air Force back into civilian life. And how did this tough as nails gig come about? So transitioning, it's, it's very interesting. I, I smile because I think even now, uh, almost coming up on four years, I'm still transitioning. Um, it, is, it is something that you take day by day. Um, I think coming out of the military as a, as a retired colonel, you expect things a certain way. Uh, you expect people to behave a certain way. And when that does not happen, and there are a lot of excuses, it gets you a little wound tight. So you have to learn how to maybe let go of some of that. And I see uh, Chanel laughing over there. <laughs> um, so for me, I, I transitioned. I took a couple of months off until I couldn't stand it anymore. And then I started working at a local sports club and just the work ethic, even though it was good, was just not military-like. Um, so again, I had to do a lot of meditation and take a lot of deep breaths and just take it in stride saying, it's not them, it's me. So <laughs> that's how I, I, <laughs> I kind of worked through that. The toughest nails happened um, just by happenstance. I was actually um, posting something. I was learning about social media because as a YouTube pilot, social media is something we avoid for obvious OPSEC reasons. And um, as a trainer, now I have to put myself out there and show and showcase my skills. And I was, um, I was, uh, someone contacted me and said, they looked at my profile and started digging deep and said, oh my goodness, this person is not more than just a personal trainer. So, um, I, at first, when I was contacted by uh, a producer, I thought it was a scam. And as I looked into it, I said, huh, okay, well, let's see what this is about. And fast forward, here I am. What's it been like? What's the experience been like? Um, it's been amazing. It's, uh, I will say, of my life, and I've done a lot of things in the last 50 years, this is probably one of the best experiences I've ever had. Hmm. And, and not only because of, you, you know, TV in itself um, is just a whole different animal, but I was very surprised that the, the competition in itself and the contestants that were on there, the type of camaraderie was very similar to being in the military. So after being out for three years and now being with um, 12 other people were thrust in this situation, which actually volunteered in this situation, which is highly stressful and it's competitive you start to create bonds with people very quickly and get to learn and understand people. And I will say today, even with my teammates, we talk on a, on a daily basis. And this is, it was similar, very similar to serving in the military. You were able to scratch that very specific itch of camaraderie yes. and totally get that. Absolutely, the camaraderie is something in the military that's like no other. Um, you develop those tight, bonds and that relationship with people. So um, once that's gone, you know, it's like Star Trek being part of the board collective. Once you are disconnected, there's always this emptiness that you you're missing. And it's great to every so often get that feeling again. So one of the great things about this format is that we're able to get some questions from people who are watching in real time. So I've got a ton more stuff I want to cover. But let's just take a quick second, almost sort of like a lightning round, and just um, run down the list of, uh, let me throw one question out to each of the four of you. All right, and Meryl, since you're up, we'll start with you. We'll go to Chanel and Emily and Dawn. Uh, here's a question from someone watching. For all the women on the panel, who are some of the women in leadership 
slash roles of influence who you look up to? Meryl? I would say one of the people recently um, who I looked up to in the military, her name was General Harris, Stacey Harris. She was a, she retired as a three-star general. She was a person who, when I was Lieutenant Colonel, was a one-star and we had met at a, at a, um, an event where there was a women's panel. And the first time I met her, I was just in awe by how she conducted herself. And we had a lot of conversations and it was nice to talk to another woman of color who was in this position, who was also an aviator who flew C-141s. And it was great to actually pick her brain and actually have a great discussion and talk about the things that we were going through. So I think because of her is, is a reason why I stayed in longer um, when I picked up Colonel, because I was actually going to retire prior to pinning on Colonel. Hmm. And um, we just had a great discussion on what that means and what will it mean for other people coming up and how long it takes to groom someone. In the Air Force at that time, the only two black women above the rank of 06 was myself and her. So it was just great to um, have that person there and just kind of see what she did and actually do things that were similar to pave the way for those that they were grooming. Because you can't be what you can't see. And so if you see it, 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 it becomes real. Totally get that. Absolutely. Chanel, can you give me uh, somebody who is a, a woman in leadership or a role of influence that uh, you look up to? So I'm so fortunate to have so many women um, to look up to in my family and um, some in corporate America and some in the army. I think one person that I will um, name specifically is Staff Sergeant Howard. And um, she served as a, a mentor to me while I was in the military, also a black female. So um, I, I definitely believe, you know, if you, if you can see it, if you can see that person in this role doing amazing things and being an, an amazing person and being a mother and a wife. Um, so, and she was all of it um, while still serving as a staff sergeant. So I, I definitely think she was one of um, the people that I looked up to, especially in the military. Okay, great, Emily. Um, I would have to say my boss, Maria Ferrari, and it's not because she might be watching. Good use of um, an answer, Emily. <laughs> Very good use of an answer. She, um, has co-created a television show. She's a very funny writer and woman. She's a mother. She's a boss on the show and really has the heart of a teacher. And, uh, I, I couldn't be more, um, lucky to work for her. Awesome. Dawn? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it, it's interesting as I look at women leaders, some of them in some cases inspire me, um, you know, and, and if they, in this case, uh, I'll throw somebody out who really inspired me and continues to actually, she, she reported to me, she was a private um, at the time uh, when I first met her and sort of grew up watching her um, just continue to be, you know, uh, uh, an amazing woman, but uh, private Rose, who I served with uh, over in Iraq, um, got called into a, a mission at one point. They need uh, the special forces team that, that we were sort of co-located with needed a, a gunner. And the only gunner we had available was, was a, a female, um, which was interesting because at the time there were no women integrated into these units. And, you know, she was actually uh, one of our best gunners and most proficient. And she uh, joined their team and went out on a couple missions with them. And when they came back, they said, we want her every time. And, you know, she, she just garnered so much respect for her competency um, and just really continue to emerge to um, be an amazing leader and uh, just continue to be inspired by what she's doing today outside of the military. Um, and, and, you know, just really, I think, leading through action uh, now as a mother, um, as a former service member, veteran, um, and, and just watching her continue to thrive um, really inspires me. So you can sometimes you can learn the most from from people that are reporting to you in some cases. You know, it's it's funny. We've talked about it. I've heard um, a couple of times in the time we've been chatting this notion of mother, uh, job. Um, it seems to me, if we're talking about superheroes, that the superpower that you folks must have more than anything else, that women must have in particular, is being a super juggler, right? That's, that's the superpower. You got to be a super juggler. Dawn, what has... What is the role of learning how to juggle, keep the plates spinning, 
A, is it something you've had to sort of become an expert at? And B, in 2021, do you think women still have to be better jugglers than men? Um, you know, it, it, you asked me a little bit ago what, what the word resiliency means. And, and I mean, I think you just defined it uh, for me in, in much better terms, but it is kind of that super juggler, right? It's, it's keeping a lot of different things in the air, um, continuing to sort of multitask. Um, and, and so I, I do think that, um, you know, women tend to, you know, take on a lot of responsibility. I mean, women are known sort of as um, you know, community builders, right? And I think when when you are kind of, uh, you know, in many cases central to your family, whether it's your own children or you know you're a caregiver, you know, women just continue that you know they're they're kind of like liquid. They fill gaps and continue to take yes. take on roles when there's a need. And you know that is, I think, again, we're talking about service, we're talking about community, we're talking about resiliency. I mean that that really defines women, right? Those those characteristics. And I think as we we think about how women are naturally, I. Think think they just tend to do those things. Um, but I think there's also an expectation there, right? And so I do think women's expectations are in some cases can be, you know, greater than, you know, some of their male counterparts, whether we're talking about, you know, women in the military, women in, in business. Um, and, and so sometimes, yeah, I, th I think women do have to juggle a lot. Um, and, and, you know, so again, I think we just have to continue to push forward with thinking about, you know, policies um, and, and practical accommodations to ensure that, you know, we can support women as, as they take on, you know, kind of these preeminent roles in their communities, in their households, you know, and again, try to try to juggle as much as they can. I mean, 30 plus years I've been having these conversations with female colleagues. I think it's very important to acknowledge there is while we need to have this push for equality in every part of our workplace, I still feel, I don't know if it's biology, but there still is this, this, this component to being a juggler that women, it's almost still an obligation or incumbent upon women to juggle in a way that men can sort of still in some way get away with not having to be quite as proficient as, as jugglers. You agree with that? Yeah, Jim, you know, I do agree. And I think that, you know, even if we just look at kind of where we are today with this pandemic and some of the roles, you know, the increased responsibilities. Now, granted, I have a lot of male friends who, you know, yep. maybe they're the ones taking on the role of, of you know, kind of school teacher, yep. Uh, yep. babysitter, you know, what have you. But in, in many cases, it's women. And in fact, some of my female colleagues, um, I'm watching them juggle so much at home and at work and just continuing to push forward, knowing, you know, what they're going through behind the scenes with, with COVID and kids at home and things like that, and just trying to keep their families safe, but yet not miss a beat at work. And so I really do think, you know, we see that kind of upfront, uh, uh, you know, um, right now with COVID. Emily, I, I suppose, you know, sure, it's getting better, but would you agree that there's still this sense of women needing to develop this superpower of super juggling? Absolutely. Um, I think much to what Don was saying, I think COVID has put a different light on that. Um, I've worked now in a number of Zoom rooms for my job and, and you know, there are little kids that toddle in or there's somebody that needs internet help with their homework and having it right there in front of your colleagues, I think has really been a good example of how, you know, the the women in our room are are not only writers but they are moms or internet technicians and and you know the full gamut and i think it's while it's very important to say hey we're getting better it's just as important to acknowledge yes but we still have a ways to go um there's still some way in which that super juggler role falls more to females than males i i think in our culture i don't think that's such a controversial statement um, Meryl, what kind of juggler are you? So I was, th I was thinking about the answers to this and, and I, I always say it's controlled chaos in a way uh, when I deal with these situations, but uh, my husband is, and I, I have to give him a lot of props um, because he uh, controls as much chaos as I do. Uh, during COVID, we took on a foster child and you know, for him, he tried to stay home as much as possible to be that intermediary where school was closed and we're both sharing the responsibility of teaching my son and now my foster daughter school 
they're in different grades and they're under the age of 10. So, um, and we had to juggle all that with his job, me training clients and not getting COVID. So uh, there's a lot of, again, controlled chaos going on. So it's constant all the time. I am fortunate and lucky enough to have a husband that is understanding um, and is pitching in sometimes more than I can and it ebbs and flows, but we have that communication piece that is key in order to make sure that is successful. Did the military equip you with certain skills that allowed you to control the chaos a little better? Yes. So I, I think when you're under pressure and for all the women on this panel here, you know, you face stressors that are life and death. So when faced with that, when you see a kid crying because they don't get the dessert that they want, there's, you can kind of prioritize that, that it's not that serious and that you can get through that day um, or you can get through that. Um, when you have a child that comes into the home that carries so much more baggage than you can ever imagine, mm. you have to be patient and understand that in the big scheme of things, you're giving her an opportunity that will you know, help and you use those things that you learned from the military to become patient and compassionate and empathetic to that child in order to become successful. Chanel, did you pick up any skills in your time serving the country that you employ now as uh, in terms of your ability to either deal with controlled chaos or juggling? Yeah, I felt after basic training that I could actually do anything. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I will say that juggling or control chaos is a part of our day to day. And I honestly feel like it's just a part of the day, right? We, we figure mm -hmm. it out, we get through it. I think it's about discipline. I think it's about structure. I think it's about, um, you know, respect for what we do, what we do and what others do. And you kind of, and about resilience and you kind of just get through it. And so I definitely attribute a lot of that to the military. I've got a question here from someone watching named Maria that I want to run by each of you. What are some of the misrepresentations you see of women in service displayed in the media? And what can we do to combat that? Chanel, can you think of anything to start us off with? Misrepresentations you see of women in service. Oh, let me think about that. Um, Actually, I've seen good representation of women in service. What do you see that you like? Um, how we can do anything, how we're tough, mm -hmm. um, we're mm -hmm. resilient. Mm -hmm. um, so if I think of misrepresentation, maybe it's that we're not as tough as the males, right? Uh -huh. so, so maybe it's not doing something that... Um, a male, a, a, a one of our men soldiers would do. Um, maybe that's it. We can finally put that one to rest, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Meryl, any misrepresentations you see of women in service that need to be addressed as far as you're concerned? As far as I'm concerned, no. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't see any misrepresentation. Look, women, as more women are coming into roles and serving in all these positions that men are now serving in, you know, they're gonna, some are gonna do extremely well, some are gonna do okay. Maybe some will falter a little bit, but that's just part of, that's just part of the job. I mean, women across the board have all these different uh, skill levels and skill sets. So I don't see any misrepresentation. It's just that maybe if, if one woman in a role makes a mistake, it is amplified because she is the only one. And I think that puts, you know, for women in these roles, it puts a lot of pressure on them to perform at the highest level all the time. But it happens, we're human, we're human beings, we're fallible, we make mistakes. But I think overall, women do an outstanding job um, at keeping it together and at doing it as, better, as well or better than their male counterpart. It's a really good. It's a really good point you're making though about the bright light when it's focused on somebody who is a first 
or represented in fewer numbers, it can uh, disproportionately amplify uh, any kind of mistake. The bright light can be can be an issue. Emily, anything you see um, that addresses Maria's question about misrepresentations of women in media? Um, I would say maybe not quite misrepresentation, but something that we just don't see a lot um, would be the the partners, the spouses of mm. of those mm. who serve, um, whether it be a woman or a man. Um, that person that's at home is doing a service too of running, you know, helping to run the household, being the cheerleader to the service member. Um, you know, it's it takes. It takes a village, I think. One of the most moving experiences of my entire life uh, in 2003, the run up to the war in Iraq, I'm, I'm in the desert in Kuwait watching soldiers train. And at that point, not everybody had a ability to cell phones and satellite phones were in common. So we were letting soldiers use our satellite phone. And I watched the soldier pick up the phone, dial his wife, burst into tears because he had just been told that his wife was pregnant and he was gonna be a father. And it just struck me as, my God, we don't understand this, the sacrifice uh, men and women who serve this country make in terms of the most basic things we take for granted, finding out you're gonna be a father or a mother because you're halfway across the world um, uh, defending the country. So I think your point uh, is a very important one. Uh, Don, your thoughts about misrepresentation? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you to Maria for asking the question. I think it's actually a really good question. Um, and I certainly, you know, agree with all the points, you know, that Chanel, Merrill and, and Emily had some great points too about just, you know, you know, we don't, we don't really showcase, you know, kind of what's going on behind the scenes, but I, I you know, I think that we, we also probably don't really showcase what's going on, you know, in front of the scenes. I mean, I, I, I feel like I still, like I said, I get questions, you know, even today, somebody, so how'd you lose your arm? Okay, well, I was in the military, I was in combat, you know, and I get the oh, women are in combat, like people are still shocked by that. And, and, and I'm shocked that they're shocked. And yeah. <laughs> when I think about it, you know, I, I do think that, again, we've talked about all the progress, and we've talked about now that we have a lot of firsts, you know, we have women in you know, in, in the on the army side and ranger school, sapper school, you know, seer school, right? All these doing all these kind of amazing things. But you know, the movies that we're watching, they still showcase male leaders and male, um, you know, sort, sort of leads and these, you know, these stories that are that are all amazing and inspiring um, and, and worthy of watching. But it's like, where do we see the, you know, the movie about, you know, kind of that female leader that was in combat and, you know, did some heroic, you know, heroic things. So I still think that, you know, misrepresentation may be a, a strong word, but I think we need more representation, I guess, would be would be my point. All right. Are these things. Um always go faster than I want them to because we always have so much uh, to try to jam in. But I do have a couple of more things I wanna touch on during the course of our, our panel. Um, the concept of service, all right? We talked about resilience. I wanna talk about service. Now, Don, you have a vision for your company continuing to serve. Tell me what you're getting at there with the vision and why that's a core fundamental value for your company. Sure. Um, so yeah, it, continuing to serve is is something that's, you know, I feel like kind of in my DNA and certainly in the DNA of the company. But what that really gets at is just I think the idea, and I and I completely took this from the military, that like when you know a group of people come together um, to to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves, right? It's this idea that together we can do more, together we can do anything, and and I think particularly as we think about it in today's world, you know, and 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 liken it to the military, bringing people together from different cross sections of society, you know, in the military, you don't choose who's in your unit, right? Um, you don't choose the people you're leading. You uh, are playing the hand you're dealt and it's your job as a leader to make sure that, you know, the unit functions as one and can accomplish any mission they're given. And I think as we, as we think about, you know, kind of how we continue to serve, you know, certainly as I think about it from a business perspective, you know, we support, you know, through the work we're doing issues of national and global significance, you know, kind of our, our clients in the government space that 
have very important missions, right? It's, it's about being mission focused. And I think that, that that's really what, you know, the idea of service is to me, and that can come in all forms, right? It doesn't have to be military service. It's, you know, we can serve our communities. So I just think it's a powerful concept and the idea that, you know, we are here uh, and, and together we can, you know, we can achieve a lot. It's such a, the service is sort of by definition, other focused, right? So it's something you're giving to somebody else. And we're all trying to live our best lives and trying to stay other focused. But Emily, I'm, I'm interested in this idea that we're also involved in trying to be successful, trying to accomplish certain things, achieving certain things. The balance one has between accomplishing our own goals and serving others, there's a tension there. How do you address that in your life, Emily? I mean, I think that if your focus is always on the greater good over the individual, um, that that is a guiding principle that can kind of lead you um, through those tensions. I know particularly with with our show that we're working on, you know, yes, it is is it a comedy show and entertainment, but we're also highlighting some heavy issues. We are talking about, you know, SIV visas for Afghan and um, Iraqi interpreters coming to the United States. So I think if you if you try to walk hand in hand with both service and career that, um, you know, you're able to to do good on both sides. Yeah, do well and do good. Those are always two, uh, they pair nicely, don't they? <laughs> doing well and, and doing good. Meryl, define service for me as you think about it and how do you approach uh, providing it in your life? How did you as an active duty military officer and how do you do it now? For me, service, I mean, it, it's, it's giving. So what comes to mind now is, as people are talking is, is about mentorship and Mm. and about mm. helping people be better versions of themselves. And whether that was in the military, um, even before becoming a colonel, you know, I mentored people and I was also mentored, but it became more apparent to me when I took on the role of colonel and saw how many people at this level were not being represented, you know, black females. I said I was gonna do everything I can for the remainder of my time in the military to reach out, especially when I worked in the Pentagon in my last area, um, to talk to as many people as possible and get my story out and help people, again, become better versions. And I've taken that, that ethos, I guess, with me as I've retired. So mentorship and inspiring for me, whether it's through fitness, whether it's through uh, helping people social media wise that I get questions all over the world for people who want to be pilots, who want to join the military and to be able to answer their questions and to help them and guide them and maybe give them other recommendations. Um, to me, that is service before self. Um, taking on a foster daughter, giving her an opportunity that she may not have had because she has a, got dealt maybe not the best hand. To me, that's service before self. So. I, I use those and I wanna to continue to do that in underserved communities. And as I walk this journey, you know, I'm doing more things. So that's how I look at it. I, I just wanna underscore something you're saying cause I, I couldn't believe any more strongly in it. Um, mentorship is the most important thing you can give at a certain point in your career because as my kids have been raised, accident of birth determines so much, right? Like people just show up to both good hands and bad hands. And if a kid has shown up and didn't get the best hand, you have an obligation, especially if you've had a good hand to, um, to foster, to mentor, to provide the lessons that can help everybody uh, sort of improve their, their station and standing. So thank you for articulating that so clearly and movingly. I think it's very, very important. Uh, Chanel. Um, the idea of service, how do you, how do you get your arms around it? So I think the service is um, very simply, as everyone's been saying, is really doing for others, right? Um, sometimes 
Um, I think Meryl said it best, doing for others um, and, and not necessarily maybe getting credit for it. Um, I think my service and accomplishments and achievements go hand in hand. I think when you serve, you learn right? When you serve, you get from others as well. And I don't think you can um, accomplish all your goals without helping and servicing others. So I really think it goes hand in hand. I think it's so important to do things in your community, um, to serve our country, um, and anything, any, anything else that we can kind of help others without necessarily getting the credit for it. Well, but it, and, and that service isn't is not just a, a one direction uh, transaction. Anytime you give, you get something back. I mean, that's the most basic and obvious point you'll hear tonight, but it's one worth repeating, right? You give, you live a life of service and you receive back just in the giving. Absolutely. All right, so we have time for one more question that I want everyone to take a deep breath with and uh, spend some time sketching out your, your thoughts and feelings um, to this. Next generation, all right? You are uh, in a position where you are going to be giving advice to the next generation of young women coming along in your profession or in some part of your personal life perhaps, but in an area of importance to you. What is the guidance? What is the recommendation that you would give to young women who are entering the places you were in the military or just in life in general, where you may have been 20 years ago? Go ahead, Chanel. Let's start with you. I think I would have to say, one, be your best self. Always be your best self first. Um, if you can stand in your truth, um, I would advise that you, you know, stand for something, stand in your truth, be your best self and love everyone. Really embrace all differences. Um, I think that's what the advice I would give. I love that. And, and, and especially since it's not always possible to try to be, it's always possible to try to be your best self. You're not always going to get over the bar, but it's a, it's a pretty nice standard to try to set. So perfect, perfect. Meryl, what do you have uh, by way of counsel and guidance for women who are just coming up, maybe just starting in the military or just transitioning out of the military into civilian life? What would you offer by way of counsel? So for the women who are transitioning out of the military into civilian life, I would have to tell them what someone said to me once, you think that this step that you're gonna take is like stepping off this huge wall. But in fact, when it happens, it's like stepping off the curb. It's just gonna continue. And don't be afraid of that change. This change is, it's coming, it's gonna be wonderful. And I tell people even in retirement, there's some things I'm learning, but it is glorious because now, you can take the skills that you have and you can apply that and make other people's lives better. For those who are younger, who are starting their next phase in life, graduated college or high school, and they're happy, um, I have a, one thing to say, uh, a few things. One, this generation's extremely innovative and creative. And the fact that we are going through COVID and we're coming out, they're extremely... Uh, versatile and resilient. We've used that quite a bit. So whatever their next endeavor is, and it's a little tough love because the ladies here on this panel, we've been through things where there was not that many opportunities. These opportunities are wide open. Mm -hmm. You guys need to suck it up and let's go because it's there. It's there for your taking. You can do this and there's no excuses. If you haven't seen someone at that position, then you be the one that other people look up to. And, and, that's, and that's how you should take life on. Just grab it and go. If you're gonna fail, it'll make you better. You're not, it's, failure is a good thing. So no, let's do I, I always it. say, I always say, Meryl, nobody fails, they just stop trying. Absolutely, yes, 
Yes. That's, so, you know, your answer is extraordinarily inspirational and, and thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Emily? Um, well, it's very similar to what Meryl was saying in that I would say take, you know, take the leap, take the risk, take the challenge, have the confidence to do that. Because even if it doesn't turn out the way that you want it to, you're going to learn something from it. You're going to grow in probably in a way that you didn't expect. So, you know, nothing bad can come from challenging yourself. No, the wisdom is in the scar tissue. Always, right? You got to you gotta skin the knees a little bit. That's where you find the wisdom. It's, it's in the scar tissue. Dom, what, what, uh, what counseling guidance might you be able to offer the next generation? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, all, all the answers, answers thus far were great. And I'll just kind of tack on to that, um, maybe saying the same thing, but in sort of a different way. I mean, I feel like as women, um, you know, let's just, you know, for these women coming up, don't let society define you, you know, don't let, you know, just kind of all the different stereotypes out there about women, gender identification, you know, define you, um, go out and chart your own path. And, and as, Everybody has said thus far, don't be afraid to, to fail uh, or, or stop trying. Um, and, and I think there's a couple of just quick points to tack on is, you know, find a good mentor. Um, you know, we talked a lot about mentorship. Find a mentor, find somebody who, you know, sort of been there, done that, can see around the corner um, and can help. Um, but at the, and at the same time, find the right community, I think, is women you know, um, just, you know, find a community that ex that espouses the values, you know, the characteristics that you want to espouse and mm. um, be a part of that community. I think that's, that's really important as women, as we think about our roles in our families and in our society and in, our, in the workplace. Well, I think the only thing uh, that I would add um, is that it's very important always to express gratitude. So as we wrap up, I want to express gratitude First of all, uh, to the Viacom CBS Veterans Network team, Rich, Betty, Brad, uh, Brian, Melanie, Otto, Tiffany, Matt, Chris, the whole Viacom CBS Veterans Network, uh, just want to say thank you to you. But these four panelists who have spent time with us tonight, uh, Meryl Teng Tengestal and Don Halfaker and Emily Brandstetter and Chanel Lamb, we are feeling so grateful to all four of you for spending time with us, sharing your insight, uh, your inspiration, your wisdom. So from all of us, a heartfelt uh, and deep uh, sense of gratitude is flowing from us to you. So thank you so much. And everybody, thanks for joining us. And we'll say good night.